Yes. And, and that's like about 10 minutes? Well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this session of Binia's Data Week. Um, Seema has put together a wonderful panel of speakers for you on the mitigating effects of smart surfaces on urban heat. And I wanna direct you to the link in the chat to the impressive bios of our speakers, Dr. Georges Benjamin, Elizabeth Gawthorpe, Kim Knox, Greg Katz, and Ryan McCaig. Um, this is such a timely discussion uh, as we are right in the middle of high summer heat and Health Commissioner Dr. Zraza declared a code red extreme heat declaration for Baltimore City uh, on Sunday and through till today. Um, when you have a high percentage of land covered with hard surfaces and dark surfaces, that absorb heat and you have less greenery and tree canopy for cooling effects, urban heat islands can be dangerous to the people that are living in them. And um, last week I saw an article in Energy and Environment News reminding us that 25 years ago, uh, no doubt before some of you were born, um, temperatures in Chicago spiked up to 115 degrees. And during an extended heat wave in that city, 739 people died. Um, so now considered one of the deadliest climate disasters in US history, it killed three times as many people as Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Harvey combined. Um, the staggering death toll from extreme heat was unprecedented. And according to this article at the time, no one described heat waves as climate uh, disasters. Um, I'll read from the article. It was the worst in oldest neighborhoods in more industrial parts of the city where many of the homes and businesses had little ventilation and black roofs and where they tended to be surrounded by asphalt. Sound familiar to Baltimore? Um, living with the heat and dying from it occurs disproportionately in lower income neighborhoods and in communities of color. Um, so as we know, along with extreme heat, come other extreme weather patterns, including increased precipitation and severity of storms and flooding, as well as sea level rise and climate change is going to make all of this worse. Um, so we're gonna use this session to first learn about the relationship between climate and public health from Dr. Georges Benjamin. Uh, then we will shift the screen to Elizabeth Gawthorpe who will describe her research and reporting on work to identify climate change impacts on human health and the preparedness of health departments um, given our warming planet. And then we're going to have a demonstration by the Smart Surfaces Coalition of a new tool that is being adapted to Baltimore City neighborhoods to document the benefits of converting hard dark surfaces to smart surfaces. And finally, Kimberly Knox will give us an interview, or I'm sorry, an overview of the Green Network Plan and reuse of vacant properties to benefit communities and environment in Baltimore. 
So with that, I would like to turn over the screen to Dr. Georges Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much for, for having me today. And let's uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about the heat. Uh, obviously, there's impact of climate change on human health is profound. Um, you know, we get the rising carbon dioxide levels, which result in rising temperatures, um, you know, more extreme weather. Um, the heat, of course, results in rising sea levels. Uh, and we have a whole range of environmental um, results of that, from air pollution um, to changes in actually the, the, the bugs, the vectors that we have um, in our society. Um, increasing allergens, water quality changes, um, water and food supply becomes uh, more challenged, particularly um, in rural communities. Uh, environmental degradation, um, which because of results in forced migration and civil conflict, um, there's also a mental health impact uh, on climate change, uh, more depression, more moodiness, um, and of course, lots of severe weather. The biggest one, of course, that we're concerned about today is to talk about this extreme heat that we're having. And of course, uh, we have a very, very hot day here in Baltimore um, as an example of that. Yes, it is the summer, uh, but we're having, what's happening is, is that the heat is hotter, um, particularly in places that aren't used to it. Uh, and of course, we're having more heat waves. That means more days of, of terrible heat uh, and you combine that with um, lots of pollution, then you get, low, you get more cold red days. So you get a lot of cardiovascular disease and lung disease um, impact where you have more people who actually get sicker and die uh, from that. I think the big challenge as we talk about the heat um, is the fact that, it, particularly in the time of COVID, um, as we are now, we're in our homes, it creates an enormous challenge um, for us to mitigate it. Uh, you know, um, some of us are fortunate enough to have air conditioning. I actually grew up in Chicago, and I grew up in a home where my mom didn't like air conditioning. She had arthritis, um, and the air conditioning made her arthritis worse. So we, we lived in a, um, a large bungalow, and, but we didn't have air conditioning. Um, we were able to open up our windows, um, but that still was an issue for in many communities, particularly in urban settings or people who live in high rises. So because of the, the, the dangerousness of the communities they may live in, because, or because they live in high rises, um, or simply because they may be like my mom um, and they don't want to air conditioning, um, their risk of, of heat related illness goes up. And there's things we can do about that. Um, and so obviously our, our, our discussion today is to talk about the role of the built environment in doing that. Um, I, do, I do need to point out that this climate burden is not shared equally. We do have climate sensitive populations um, for which climate change has a disproportionate impact uh, on their health. Certainly extremes of age, the very old, the very young, the same groups of folks that are more impacted by, by heat um, lower income communities, again, for many of the reasons I just talked about, um, and, and certainly some minority communities, um, again, because of where they live uh, and because of, of how they live in terms of in those communities, um, often without uh, the ability of, to, to get air conditioning, um, and increasingly in communities that, again, weren't very high. So you had com communities where the, uh, it got, you had a nice summer, it did get hot, but the, the heat waves weren't for long periods of time. Um, and their homes were not built uh, at a time in which they were in communities that either could maintain um, good cooling. Um, and that's, that's a big problem for some of those, those communities, uh, particularly in, in some of our, our southern communities right along the coast. We know that the vulnerability to climate change depends on community resilience overall. And we know that those communities can increase their general resilience 
by many of the societal factors that influence health. Obviously, dealing with things like income inequality and dealing with, um, um, which of course is a poverty issue, dealing with quality housing, those kinds of things certainly can also impact one's, one's health. We know those societal factors that influence health are a range of things like jobs and schools and, and nutritious food and safe communities and green space. Um, but I just want to point out today, we're going to talk about very specifically the built environment. I know you're going to have a more detailed discussion about that after I'm done. We obviously know that dark surfaces absorb um, rather than reflect most of the sun's heat. Um, and that the heating the city and increasing air pollution is one of the byproducts of that. We know that urban settings, for example, have a lack of agitation and trees to absorb the heat um, to reduce pollution and provide shade. Again, I grew up in Chicago and I had a, a nice walkable, bikeable green community, but there are many communities that are not like that. And increasingly in our urban communities, we've disinvested in those communities. We've paved the roads, we put dark surfaces on all the roofs. Um, and so in, in many, you know, the, the amount of uh, um, ability to um, be in a cool environment has, has reduced over time. We know that dark surfaces make our cities about nine degrees warmer on average, and that this effect is aggravated in low-income neighborhoods, again, with less vegetation and, and more dark surfaces. Um, this is a picture of Richmond, Virginia. Um, again, where you, you look at um, um, lower-income communities uh, around this community called Oak Grove, um, where the temperatures were as high as 100 degrees. Um, and the higher income communities were as much as 12 degrees cooler. The red shows that they're hotter and the, the bluer communities are cooler. 2018 in Baltimore, we had a, uh, a heat wave up to 103 degrees and it had lots of emergency medical conditions, more strokes, um, increase in chronic obstructive lung disease, uh, and other respiratory conditions, cardiac arrest rose by 80%. We saw increases in hypertension. And again, I mentioned the issue around mental health. So more psychiatric disorders, more substance mi misuse, and dehydration spikes occurred. Uh, increased hospital visits for Medicaid patients um, in parts of the city um, versus other parts of the city were shown. Uh, and then low-income patients in hotspots had more doctor visits for things like asthma COP and heart disease. So that's why we, we know these numbers are pretty real. Um, this is obviously an example of Baltimore City during that time period. Um, and obviously um, upper north Baltimore um, where there's a higher income community uh, compared to um, the lower income communities um, where there um, you see both the, the heat and the cool in those, those communities based on income and income being a surrogate um, in some communities um, for race, and some communities certainly for poverty um, because of income. But just to show that there is a difference even in Baltimore City. And you're gonna talk more about that. I mean, obviously, um, we have lots of things that, that make those communities more vulnerable. We talked about the, the less trees, the dark and pervious surfaces, um, but there's obviously some things we can do about that. Um, you're gonna talk more about smart uh, surfaces. So I just remind you that you do get the reflective aspect from the, um, the cooler surfaces. And we're trying to encourage people um, to re reconstruct our communities so they're cooler uh, based on how we build these communities. We also important to know that it can cut CO2 uh, equivalents when you do this. And then this is an example of some of the smart surfaces that, uh, that exist, um, reflective roofs, green roofs, um, putting porous pavements on, on the ground, um, combining solutions where you get solar um, that um, can help reflect both the roofs and the roads. Uh, and of course, adding more trees, simply planting trees has an enormous impact, both for reducing carbon dioxide, as well as addressing water runoff. Um, and then of course, providing shade in those communities. And then this is an example of um, moving from dark surfaces to light surfaces and recognizing again that we have far too many communities with these very, very dark uh, impervious roofs um, and dark streets. Then as I close, just to point out that if we can combine smart surface 
um, tools with um, uh, efforts to, to really cool communities. Uh, we can get these communities much cooler than they, than they are each and every day, even though we have these enormous heat waves. With that, I'll stop and um, happy to take any questions. Uh, there was the question about what is the link between dark surfaces and higher temperature and air pollution? Well, I think, I think, I think the biggest issue is, is the fact you don't have as many trees um, and you get more air pollution. So it's a combination of, of dark surfaces with, of course, an increase in temperature. Um, you, you don't get, um, you know, get the sun reflecting. Um, pollution stays on the ground, you know, in, in hotter temperatures, small. Um, doesn't rise, it, it, it really stays lower. Uh, and so then people have um, more exposure to uh, put polluted air. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I, would just, I would just add to what Dr. Uh, Benjamin said that, that uh, smog is obviously heat driven and sunlight driven. And so when you reduce ambient temperature, provide shading, you're directly reducing smog. Um, green surfaces obviously also trap pollutants, ozone precursors, PM 2.5, things that are damaging to the respiratory system. Um, and then, of course, when you reduce your energy consumption, which you do by reducing building uh, energy uh, cooling loads as well as cooling loads citywide, you are reducing peakers. And those peakers are typically fossil fi uh, fired powered uh, power plants uh, that operate in the summer. And those typically uh, for DC and Baltimore and the larger Baltimore region that is upwind of us. It's the Ohio Valley. Those are a lot of coal plants and fossil fuel plants. So those are three or four ways that air quality improvements are directly and positively benefited by smart surfaces. Do any of the panelists have other questions for Dr. Benjamin? Uh, Dr. Benjamin, I don't know if you're okay with this, but we, we had the Go great good fortune of working with you and your colleagues to uh, develop an analysis looking at how smart services affects equity, health, and actually has a positive impact uh, on pandemic risk reduction. So, for example, we now know that for every one part per million reduction in PM 2.5, correlates with an eight to 10% mortality reduction from COVID. So there's, there's actually multiple pathways as Dr. Benjamin pointed out. I mean, the, the less burden you have in terms of excess heat, the more resilient you are. Conversely, the sicker you are, the more vulnerable you are to heat risk and heat stress, the more vul vulnerable you are to a pandemic. So one of the slides that Dr. Benjamin showed earlier maps a whole series of pathways where excess heat and related burdens that can be addressed by smart services translates into physiological and physical and respiratory and health impacts that result in both premature death, sickness, and then large cost burden on the city. So it's somewhat complicated, multiple pathways. The data is very clear on it. Smart surface is not a complete answer, but it's a very large part of the answer and it's cost effective. So we have another question uh, from the audience. How much difference would it make if black tar roofs were replaced with white roofs? <laughs> this might be one for Greg. And which neighborhoods are planting yeah. vacant lots with trees? That might be for Kimberly. Yeah, you know, you're right. Um, you know, I mean, say you get to eight, eight, eight or nine uh, percent easily reduction in temperature when you when you when you make those kinds of changes in the community overall. Um, I think the other part that um, remind you is that every every year we we fix the roads. Um, you know, um, there everyone's irritated every year, right? Because they're out there, you know, blocking off the roads um, and and quote unquote fixing them. But they're fixing them with uh, impervious um, surfaces. They are fixing them with dark surfaces, and they don't have to do that. They can fix them with different materials um, to, um, um, to do that. And, and while it may be a little more expensive uh, to do that, 
not 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 in the not in the to, in the totality of the of the economics of this. Um, any any cost, any additional cost in materials, and I think Gray can talk better about the cost of actually doing this. But any cost in those materials is easily offset by the savings on the health side. Great. So in terms of neighborhoods, uh, I, I would just add to what Dr. Benjamin said, which is that um, a dark surface is going to absorb 90% of the heat and it's going to heat the building below it and re-radiate heat. And in the dark type of surface, a bitumen surface, you also have gases being released, which contribute to pollution. When you paint that surface with a high albedo, you go from reflecting 10% to reflecting 90% of that sunlight back out of the atmosphere. So it exits the atmosphere and that's a direct global cooling benefit. It also means that the building itself is not absorbing heat. So you don't have an air conditioning burden in the building. And in the dark surface, which you painted, that dark surface had released that heat into the neighborhood and heated up all the adjacent buildings. So in our analysis, you can deliver two degrees Fahrenheit temperature reduction citywide per decade for citywide adoption of smart surfaces. So imagine a mayor standing up and saying, look, climate change is getting hotter. Everyone's upset. We have 100 degree days. We're putting in place a strategy to deliver two degrees of cooling per decade through 2050. So the world's getting hotter. We're getting cooler. That's, a, that's an appealing story, right? Great. And Kimberly, could you just add on the neighborhood tree planting? Yes, <clears throat> yes. Many neighborhoods are planting trees, including East Bay, East Baltimore, Midway, Broadway East, and Sandtown, Winchester. And to answer the question about how about planting trees that may feed the community, uh, many uh, residents are concerned in terms of food dropping onto sidewalks and um, onto green spaces and attracting uh, unwanted wildlife such as rodents. So that, that's always a concern that we work with in terms of the community and, and try to find um, fruit trees and nut trees that, 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 that do both, that alleviate um, the concern and yet um, provide, don't, don't provide dropping fruit and, or nuts. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and this is the last question for Dr. Benjamin so we do have to let him go. Um, what do you advise communities about how to talk about this when there are seemingly so many other issues to deal with? How do you get this front and center? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, I think we have to point out the fact that um, um, right now we're in an unprecedented time and we're looking for ways to try to reduce the um, this health disparities that we're seeing. Um, and so policymakers and resource allocators are listening and looking for solutions. And so on this list of solutions ought to be smart surfaces. And so when they talk about safe, affordable housing, they ought to talk about safe, affordable housing with light colored roofs. And they need to talk, when they talk about um, making communities walkable, bikeable, um, and green, um, obviously that means more trees. And the rationale for that also would be that it will reduce, um, you know, the temperature in those communities. So I think that the, the best way to do that is to build that in as part of the comprehensive discussion around how best to um, to reduce these disparities. Um, this is this is one of many solutions um, that, but but it works in concert with others. And again, just to point out that there's not just a health improvement here but there's an economic savings to the community to do it you know there's there's a there's an enormous enormously effective um economic model that shows that you save money and i just can cannot reiterate the fact that you're saving money on doing something you're going to do anyway whether it's building a new building renovating a building fixing the road you're going to be doing it anyway so the question is why not do it smarter than we're doing it today and healthier. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin, for joining us today. I know that you do have to run off and so appreciate you being here and sharing your knowledge with us um, and hope that we'll be able to uh, benefit from that in the future also. Take care. Good luck to you in the rest of your show. 
<laughs> Thanks. And now we're going to turn our attention to Elizabeth Gawthor um, to hear from her. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, and thanks for having me today. Um, so uh, I'm a journalist at Columbia University, um, and I worked with a team of reporters um, in collaboration with the Center for Public Integrity, which is a DC-based nonprofit newsroom, um, on a story about how the CDC is addressing and preparing for the health impacts of climate, um, and how those federal efforts um, uh, sort of trickle down and contribute to what local and state health departments can do. So I'll talk a little bit about the story itself and then um, I will go into some of the data that we used in the story as well. Sense of data week. Um, so uh, as many of you probably realize, climate change awareness from the beginning has had a sort of dominating theme of environmentalism, but there hasn't been as much uh, attention to the health impacts, um, which in fact are already happening. Uh, with the World Health Organization estimating that climate change contributes to 150,000 deaths per year already um, worldwide. So we wanted to understand uh, what's being done about climate and health in the U.S. Um, and especially, you know, what the federal response has been. Um, and essentially, we found that the CDC has a climate and health program, um, but compared to the scale of climate impacts, it's a relatively small effort. Um, and it's small compared to other initiatives at the agency. Um, they essentially fund some scientists to do research at a national level, and then they also fund about 20 state and local health departments. Um, it started off as a pilot program at the beginning of the Obama administration, although it was after some momentum had built up at the end of the Bush administration. Um, but budget-wise, it hasn't really grown from that pilot stage, um, and this means that for the states um, and a few cities that do participate, they're getting about $200,000 a year. Um, so with that, they're supposed to figure out for the whole state what the biggest climate threats are, who's most at risk, um, how to best help people, and then actually carry out that plan. So what we heard over and over um, from some of the folks involved was that it's just not a lot of money to do um, all that work. Um, and in addition to it not being a lot of money, there are other barriers. Um, it's a relatively new field, so there just aren't, um, especially, you know, until the last few years, there weren't a lot of people um, that had the knowledge and expertise at this cross-section of climate and health. Um, so sometimes uh, folks couldn't even find people to hire, even if they did have the resources. Um, and then, of course, uh, politics of climate change in some areas plays a bigger role than in others. So to show why all of this mattered, um, and matters. We uh, use the example impact of heat. Um, it's not the only health effect of climate change, but it is one of the more direct ones, and it's already in most years the deadliest weather impact for Americans, um, as Beth was talking about. And unfortunately, there are many different ways that people can be vulnerable to heat, um, as Dr. Benjamin already talked about. Um, and what's really heartbreaking to me about heat is that, as public health officials say, every heat-related death is uh, preventable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this brings me to a quote that one of my uh, sources, Liza Kurtz, who's a PhD student at Arizona State, um, passed on to me that she heard in a workshop, which is that heat is everyone's problem and no one's responsibility. Um, meaning that there's no one place you can go to uh, for accountability. Um, and so even though we focus our story on health departments who maybe you could argue have a little bit more responsibility than others, there are many things that are out of control of health departments too, um, like zoning and development, uh, for example, and the, the sort of smart services that we're talking about today. Um, the silver lining there is that if you're stuck on a solution, you can try to move on to something else because there are just so many, um, so many potential uh, ways to help, whether it's the buildings and, and roads and surfaces that we'll, I think, learn more about soon, um, or policies that change behavior, like mandatory water breaks uh, for school athletes, or resources for people don't have for people who don't have um, access to cooling. So even though uh, health departments are sometimes limited, um, I should mention that in uh, some areas, a lot of other local agencies and organizations and sometimes even businesses are working on uh, solutions. A few other things that I learned during the story that aren't really in the story directly, but that I think are um, relevant 
one thing I learned was that the CDC has no mandated authority over state health departments. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't really have a lot of teeth. It has, um, you know, a lot of research funding um, and not to say it doesn't um, work a lot with state health departments, but it's very different from like the EPA where they have a mandated um, authority to enforce regulations uh, that fall in their jurisdiction. Another thing I learned was um, just more about the role of health departments in our states and communities. Um, it varies a lot by jurisdiction, both in terms of the written policies, um, as well as just by the custom of the area. Um, but most of them do quite a bit of data collection and awareness raising, and then also serve as an evidence-based resource for other local agencies. Um, so just to say, if you're um, interested in how this how health departments um, work on climate in your area may be very different from place to place. Um, the last thing I'll say that I learned was um, this idea that there are no regulations for heat, um, like there are for some similar environmental hazards like air pollution, which is related. Um, but we sort of think of heat as, as this act of God, and in some ways that's true, but there are also human actions that make heat worse locally. Um, again, like uh, areas full of concrete, um, but also heat generating industrial activities, um, for example. And I'm not necessarily advocating for regulation. I don't know if that's the best way to go, but I think it's interesting to think about some of those parallels and what that could look like. Um, you know, maybe within a city, no block can be more than five degrees uh, warmer than the coolest spot in the city or something like that. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the data that we use to complement the story. Um, uh, you know, basically our story was pretty focused on policy and, and um, sort of the people trying to, to do something on the ground. Um, but we wanted to use data as a complement to that um, to really link the, the heat and health outcomes that we didn't have time to spend on in the story itself. Um, so I'll talk about a couple of the, of the data sets that we used. And a lot of this is specific to Arizona because that's where I was uh, reporting, but maybe the process will uh, spark some ideas for the, for the Baltimore area. Um, so the, the first one I'll talk about is uh, autopsy records. Um, so these were PDFs of autopsy reports that we got from the Maricopa County Medical Examiner. Maricopa County is where Phoenix and surrounding cities are. It's a huge county. Um, and basically we used these autopsy reports. We read them all and pulled out information about the temperature in the homes where people had died um, and their AC status. So Maricopa County Medical Examiner sends out an investigator when someone dies in their home to try to determine um, if heat was part of the, the cause. So there's all of this sort of data embedded in these um, reports, um, which we used for, for this interactive graphic that I, I hope, um, I mean, I certainly didn't realize this was this, you know, people's homes were this hot um, before doing this story. And I think by mining these reports, we were able to produce a graphic that shows both the scale of these deaths, as well as conveys some detail about the the harsh conditions that um, people are facing in their in their homes. Um, next slide, please. So this was another another graphic that we did um, using nine one one calls. So with health outcome data, you know, if you're not a health researcher, um, it can be very hard to get um, daily scale health data because of obvious privacy. Um, concerns, but we wanted to show the, the relationship between really hot days and um, people's health. So we used um, 911 calls from the city of Phoenix and they actually tag, um, you know, the reason for, for each call and one of those tags is um, heat. So we used that information along with um, data from, from uh, the National Climatic Data Center with the Phoenix airport uh, temperatures and then the which days had heat warnings issued um, from the National Weather Service's local office um, webpage. So sort of combined all these together um, and in doing so showed a not surprising obvious relationship between um, the, the maximum daily high temperature and the number of 911 calls. Um, I don't know if it's 
hard to read on this on this screen, but at the very top is the hottest, I'm sorry, not the hottest day. Um, uh, it was a 110 degree day, but it had the most uh, heat related calls uh, in 2019, um, but it was a day that no heat warning was issued. So not a full comprehensive study um, by any means, but it's an interesting data point. Um, as researchers, researchers are still trying to figure out um, which interventions and actions work best um, for preventing heat illness. Um, uh, that's another part of our story is sort of um, how much is unknown about, about what actually works for helping people. Uh, next slide, please. So I just listed some other data sources here in case people are interested in diving into this on their own, uh, in their own community. Um, for really hyper local temperatures, block by block, um, satellite data uh, is one way to go. And this was, um, this was used in a, a great story uh, last year called Code Red, Baltimore's Climate Divide. I definitely encourage you to um, check that out. And it was in collaboration with NPR who posted their, um, am I still here? Okay, sorry. Um, I lost Wi-Fi for a second. Um, NPR has posted their, their code for this um, with a lot of, I, I believe it has the temperature data as well. Um, so that's a great resource if your city was part of that uh, story. Um, the state climatologist office, most states have this. It's often at a state university. So if you're you know, wanting to use climate data and you're, you're uh, new, uh, I suggest going to them. They're, Often their job is both research um, as well as public outreach. Um, also, my I didn't get it up here on this slide, but my former workplace, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at Columbia University, just got a grant to help journalists with climate data. Um, and so if you uh, are interested in that, feel free to uh, contact me on Twitter or if you Google me, I'm sure you can find my contact info um, and I'd be happy to introduce you to them. Uh, a few more, the Environmental Public Health Tracking Network. This is at the CDC, as well as some states have uh, even more detailed uh, information. If you sort of Google your state and that, and that um, phrase, uh, uh, it depends on whether they have a grant to do this basically, but if they do, it's, there's good data there. Um, most health departments have an Office of Vital Statistics. Um, at the federal level, there's also data from Medicare and Medicaid. Um, it, it's not free, but there's a federal agency called the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project. Um, and state by state, it varies how much, how much it costs, um, but you can get very detailed data um, through them. And just a general tip, um, you know, someone said this to me, anytime you fill out a form, and give it to a government agency. Um, that most likely goes into a database um, and you can request that data through a records request. Um, and then in the same vein, understanding the roles that your local agencies play, uh, what they do can help you understand what data they may have. Um, and it may not always be in the form of a database, um, you know, like the autopsy records, we sort of pulled the data out of, out of, um, uh, these PDFs. So uh, I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, gosh, I, I, there are so many things in your presentation that are so incredibly interesting. Um, like uh, the CDC has no mandate over local health departments. I think that everybody in the U.S. knows that now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've all learned a lot about public health in the last six months, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. Well, who would have ever known otherwise, you know, how disorganized we are. Um, I'm not seeing uh, questions that are particular to your um, your presentation coming through right yet, but uh, there are a couple of questions that we can ask. Um, how could the city encourage investors, especially absent investors, to cool their roofs? So I think that was from the last presentation, and that might be one for Greg to answer later on. Okay, then really quickly, this is just Priya, one of the Binya staff. I'll just be sharing an introduction to the Smart Services Coalition. 
It's just a quick five minute video before um, Greg and Ryan start their presentation. The Smart Surface Transformation Story. During the summertime, more and more cities in the U.S. are experiencing extreme heat and increased number of flooding events. These are all symptoms of global warming. We're increasing global warming by making our city surfaces dark and impermeable, increasing heat and pollution, and making our cities less livable and less healthy. The average U.S. city now is two-thirds roads, roofs, and parking lots. Even worse, these surfaces are typically dark and impervious. Dark and impervious surfaces contribute to both city and global warming. And here is how. One key characteristic of a surface is albedo or reflectivity, indicating the percent of solar radiation reflected. Conventional dark surfaces have a very low albedo, absorbing sunlight and increasing air temperature. Then adjacent buildings need more air conditioning, powered by polluting power plants and increasing global warming. But the Smart Surfaces Coalition has cost-effective solutions. The coalition and its partners have shared mission of enabling and accelerating global adoption of smart surfaces. The Smart Surfaces Coalition's 40 partners are leading organizations in a range of files important to cities, including city policy, health, planning, sustainability, downtown, equity, environment, data, architecture, research, building, and many more. Smart surfaces includes high albedo and porous surfaces, green surfaces and trees, and solar panels. By choosing a smart surface, we can flip all the arrows leading to the increase of city and global warming. And here's how. Shifting to a lighter colored high albedo surfaces and green surfaces reduces the city's surface and air temperature and reduces the cooling demand in the surrounding buildings. And solar panels offset the electric demand from polluting power plants. As a result, the greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. And trees can not only reduce temperature, but also sequester CO2 directly. Smart surfaces can also mitigate flooding risks, mold, and improve public health. In many cities, conventional city surfaces are impervious, which turns almost all rainfall into runoff. Going into the combined sewer system together with the sewage from buildings, potentially leading to overflow discharging into rivers, resulting in water contamination. The flooding contaminates rivers and streams, increased mold and property damage, and imposes large human health problems. By shifting to smart surfaces, rainwater is detained by green roofs and bioswells, resulting in reduced runoff, meanwhile increasing groundwater recharge and cleaning water. Captured water can be reused for irrigation and toilet flushing, which leads to financial benefits. In addition, green roofs and trees remove the air pollutants to purify the air we breathe and improve human health. This is where we are now, a hard, dark place inimical to life that wastes sun and rain. And this is where smart surfaces can bring us, a green breathing place that is healthy and livable. The Smart Surfaces Coalition has built the tools and cost benefits engine to allow us to shape far healthier and more equitable cities. The Smart Surface Choices includes four different categories, roofs, streets and sidewalks, parking lots, and trees. The result integrates benefits from all different subcategories to calculate citywide impacts and overcome agency decision-making that ignores most city benefits. If you're looking for ways to bring equity to the city you're living in, Smart Surface offers the cost-effective choices. Case studies have shown the inverse correlation between income and surface temperature across cities. The greatest benefits accrue in low-income areas. 
it is time to use smart surfaces as the leverage to create a resilient, livable, and equitable environment. By 2030, thousands of cities will have adopted smart surfaces. By adopting smart surfaces, cities can reduce temperature by two degrees per decade and reduce global warming by 10 to 15%. By increasing the number of smart surface adoption city to hundreds and then thousands in the US and globally, we will be saving the planet together while improving urban livability, resilience, and equity. For more information, please visit at www.smartservicescoalition.org. Great, so now Greg is going to present the analytic tool that was mentioned in the video. Thank you, uh, Bert. Thank you, Beth. Um, before we go on, I was wondering if I could ask Elizabeth a question, um, because you spend a lot of time helping people take complicated data, simplifying it and communicating it. How? You know, this is sort of a complex, overwhelming subject that ties into COVID and is kind of a bit scary and a bit global and out of our control. What do you find is an effective way to capture this and communicate it and help people understand there are steps they can take in their community that materially affects the quality of their life? Uh, capture which which part do you mean? Do you mean COVID or, or climate and heat? Well, I mean, so we're all talking about smart surfaces in Baltimore and Baltimore's ability to, you know, reshape its surfaces. You've presented some fascinating data on the huge consequences of excess heat. And I'm just wondering as a professional journalist and communicator, you know, what you think works on the subject, communicating it and capturing it. Yeah, that's a, a good question. I mean, I think being able to show um, the impact on regular people's lives, um, if you can draw the connection between the, the complex um, and very data-y centric um, work and how that, how that um, ties to people's lives, you know, that's where journalism, I think, comes in as opposed to science. It's not always uh, the perfect line, but um, you have to, uh, illuminate these things with um, good storytelling um, and that that means making it relatable um, and and showing how our our fellow humans are being are being impacted by this um, um, as and I mean just you know it sounds very basic but just simplifying um, as much as you can and having the details available for those who really want a deep dive, but at least having your first uh, cut at a at a communication be um, uh, on the most simple side. You know, there's the saying that once you once you know something, it's hard to remember what it was like not to know that. Um, so I think that's something I always try to remind myself as I as I dive in deep to one of these subjects. Um, is to try to step back and ex practice explaining the problem to someone um, that I know and ask them for feedback. Those are a few things. Thank you. Um, Beth, in answer to your question, I mean, I think what's really exciting about Baltimore and the work that we're, we're doing there, thanks to you, is that there are um, parts of the city that have transformed themselves and there's a lot of exciting initiatives related to tree planting and to reconstruction, um, to um, things that are, uh, are really kind of leadership type designs at the city level. But at the same time, I think the city of Baltimore, like every other city, is really hampered because it has no way to say, okay, if we adopt costs and maintenance costs. What if we make a lot of our surfaces, parking lots and dark um, uh, flat roofs, lighter color? We intuitively know that that's beneficial 
but what are the actual benefits and how do we quantify them on a square foot basis and how do we justify given we're a tax capped region with finite resources how do we justify these investments and where do we go for those investments so the work we're doing with SEMA and, and with Baltimore and looking at four specific neighborhoods is allowing us to quantify what those benefits are in detail by each different smart surface type. And that strategy is intended with the guidance of the folks we're working with on the ground in Baltimore and SEMA and her team to sort of answer the question, where do you invest and why? What is cost effective? What are the benefits? Um, as Dr. Benjamin said, this is a disproportionately about low income areas and minority areas, which for generations have lived in communities that are darker and more polluted and more water runoff and more mold and more contamination and more sick days. And that's a really unfair burden in 2020 to put on any population, especially in an intergenerational way. The other thing I would just say is that um, what we're doing uh, now is we really understand and we expect to start work on Phoenix in this, is that if you think about the city and then at subset city level, which is the neighborhood level, you can also take a step back and say for the larger jurisdiction, what are the benefits if you, if, if you, if you encourage those jurisdictions to also adopt strategies that cool the surfaces and reduce pollution and runoff? Well, it turns out the city boundaries don't define where cooling is limited or air quality. And so those benefits cascade across the larger region. So as Baltimore thinks about its leadership role within the region and says, hey, we're starting, we're already a leader in some of these areas. We can build out smart services. We can take this to adjacent regions and those regions, when they cool, that cooler air comes into the city. When they improve their air quality, we get better air quality. When there's less flooding, it means less flooding for us. And so there's an opportunity um, at a city level for a place like Baltimore, which is already a leader on a number of these, to not improve, not just improve its community, but to draw along the larger metropolitan area. And that's sort of one of the exciting directions I think smart services can go. Um, we just had a five minute uh, video um, by S Susie is actually a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University, first PhD student in the world on smart surfaces, which is kind of cool. Thank you, Susie, for this. Um, Ryan has been working with us for about, th about four or five years. Um, in the last two years, building out this cost benefit analytic engine, we saw a couple slides from it. The purpose of that is to provide a what if tool so a city might want to say, what if we want to reduce temperature? What are the strategies? What's cost effective? What if we want to go from 17% tree coverage to 30% to 40%? What does that mean in terms of costs and benefits? What if we want to improve uh, temperature in the summer where, where Baltimore is very vulnerable because it has a big tourism industry? That tourism industry already goes and checks and says, gosh, we've got next week's going to be 102 degrees we're not doing our family visit to, to Baltimore. So if a city can adopt strategies that provides two degrees of cooling, plus shading, plus lower ambient temperature and lower radiant temperature, which can add up to 15 or 20 degrees as, as Dr. Benjamin was showing us, then it has a strategy to say to tourists, look, we understand you're concerned about heat, come here because we're a cooler city in, in a bunch of different ways. And so working with Baltimore allows us to develop this tool with your guidance to support the objectives that, that Baltimore has developed for itself, its vision for itself as a comfortable, healthy, equitable city that tourists want to go to and people want to invest in. So that's a little bit about what we're trying to do with our many partners. If I may, I'd like to turn it over to Ryan to do a deeper dive into the cost benefit analytic engine for smart surfaces that has been developed for the Smart Services Coalition. Um, let me just say one more thing about that and then get off the soapbox, which is that our partners inc include groups like Habitat for Humanity, National Housing Trust, Enterprise, and other groups that care specifically about low income. It also includes the International Downtown Association with 600 downtowns in cities in the U.S. and internationally. They care a lot about the central economic district and how that does. And so when they see a strategy like this to protect them from overheating, to protect walkable downtown retail, they're very excited. So 
the benefits accrue in this broad spectrum of ways. And what we're trying to do is support cities like Baltimore to quantify that, to understand that and make much more informed design, design decisions. So thank you, Ryan, over to you. All right, I'm up. I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, I Beth. I, excuse me, Ryan. I apologize. Let me turn it back to our our kind uh, host, uh, Beth. And Beth, I apologize. It's up to you what to do next. And again, thank you for moderating. Oh, I'm going to turn it right over to Ryan. <laughs> All right, well, we'll stick with the plan. Good. Okay. All right. I'm just going to take a moment to try to get my screen up here. Uh, am I actually, sh wait, which one's showing right now? Sorry, are you, are you seeing a Smart Surfaces Coalition thing or are you seeing? No, we see some graphs. That is not the right screen. Hold on a sec. Although it is. Uh, okay, we're going to try the other one here. Uh, do, 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 desktop one, desktop two. Ah, right, okay. All right, better? Yes. We should be seeing delivering urban resilience. Okay, uh, I will take a moment to introduce myself. I've got a lot of territory to cover and I'm told I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to move fast and hopefully we can kind of smooth over things in the Q&A. Uh, so my name is Ryan McQuaig. I'm part of a, a group of uh, software developers in uh, Vancouver, uh, Canada, um, that uh, we're, uh, we're a group of uh, building engineers, um, architects, uh, software developers, so we have a particular interest in the built environment. We had the great good fortune to uh, be engaged by uh, Greg to take this report, which was done in 2015 and 2016 for the cities of Washington, Philadelphia, and El Paso, uh, and make that and broaden that out and uh, democratize it so that it's actually possible to run um, cost benefit analyses on smart surfaces in more cities. So for anybody that hasn't seen the report, it is available uh, from the Smart Surfaces Coalition website. It is extensive. It is uh, over 300 pages of analysis. We have taken that and the financial model behind it and tried to turn it into something that is um, the minimum number of clicks to getting something that is a good starting result for you to understand the costs and benefits that are available to doing various scenarios against your city. So what I'm showing you right now is uh, the pre-release, near-release tool um, that should be run, that will run in any desktop browser. Um, some explanation of what uh, smart surfaces are about. There, we are talking about intense summer heat waves. We are talking about heavier storms being in Vancouver, probably right today at least. I'm a little more interested in that one. You're interested in the first one, but we will concentrate on heat today. So I'm gonna sneak past that. We get right into the calculator. Uh, I will take us back to a starting point. Um, down the left, we've taken it down to pick where we're talking about, pick when we're talking about, how, like over what time period do we wanna make the transformations? And again, those four uh, categories that Susie mentioned, the roofing, the parking lots, the streets and streets and sidewalks and the trees. So let's pick cities. Uh, you can see here that we've uh, been given several Baltimore neighborhoods that we're going to be concentrating on uh, that we have quantities for. So this is uh, what surface areas actually already exist in the city. We need to know those in order to apply the um, uh, analysis. So we've got Baltimore as a whole. We've got uh, Madison East End, Cherry Hill, and Brooklyn Curtis Bay. So for today's demo, I'm gonna pick Brooklyn Curtis Bay. Some statistics about it. The tree cover is roughly 15% as it exists. The population is going to play into the health and outcomes um, and uh, just what the neighborhood area is. For all of these, um, and I'm gonna come back to this uh, later, we're big advocates of the show your work approach. We're trying to provide a good starting point, but we're not necessarily the experts of every single city in the, in the United States. Um, we've provided for you to be able to just customize what those areas are. So you can see here, here's the inventory of areas that are actually necessary in order to bring a, a in order to uh, bring a neighborhood in. So how much parking lot, how much sidewalk. We break down the different types of roofs because um, different smart surface 
uh, treatments are only going to be applicable, say, to steep roofs or cool roofs, like green roofs generally tend to be for the flat ones. We are going to jump to when. So the tool is going to aggregate um, costs and benefits over a certain number of years, uh, whichever one you pick. So we'll say 2020 to 2040 for today. That's the time period over which we will be intervening to increase those surfaces. And I'll, I'll show this a little more further down. The, uh, and we, we, because a lot of these will continue to give benefits after, uh, after intervening has actually happened, after no more construction is happening, we've taken the benefit, uh, we've taken the snapshot of the benefits at 2050. So 10 years after the end of the period that you specified. We are now going to deal with roofing. You can see here that there's a uh, fair, bit of, uh, fair bit of text explaining what the smart surfaces that are applicable to roofing are, if you're unfamiliar with them. We've provided, um, I guess, yeah, uh, uh, examples or ideas of what you might want to do to the city. Click one of them. That's going to, everything works on percentages. These are just suggestions again. So you can see here that we go from a percentage, once we've been given a city and a percentage, well, we can multiply those together. We now know actually what that physical area is that we're talking about. So here I've picked moderate, that's 45%. That gives us, uh, uh, yeah, breaks down as 20, five, 10, and 10 for the four different, uh, for the four different measures. If, uh, you are interested in doing less. Let's say for Brooklyn Curtis Bay, we don't think 10% is actually really that reasonable or 1.5 million over 20 years is that all that reasonable. We can actually pull it down and uh, set it to what we want. Say that we want to uh, actually um, uh, give more priority to green roofs uh, for other reasons. Uh, to work that analysis up, we simply uh, move the sliders. That's gonna change the percentages. Because most of the rest of this is dealing with water, we're dealing with heat, I'm gonna just gloss over it a little bit for today and I'm just trying to remember which ones I'm gonna show you today. Okay, so, you know, let's, uh, we were less interested in this. Let's say that we're actually interested in not really doing too much with the parking lots and streets and sidewalks for today's purposes, uh, but we are interested in dealing with trees, right? Um, trees and the roofs, uh, providing cool roofs, high albedo roofs, those are gonna be the things that are gonna have the biggest impact on uh, heat. So at this point, uh, I can hit calculate. And you can see that what it's done is it's run through and it's given us a figure of 100, 104 million over that time period. At the bottom, we have a listing of what all that uh, man manifested as so that we can just sort of see it as a summary. So we were working from 2020 to 2040. We've accrued benefits over 2020 to 2050. The costs are about 100 million. The benefits are about 200 million. So, which means we're pulling out at about a 2.1% or sorry, a 2.1 benefit cost ratio. We get a one degree temperature reduction ambiently in the summer because of the, uh, because of the trees. And down below, we get breakdowns of how the particular breakout. So, uh, in the rows, we've got either a specific cost category or a specific benefit category. The actual number, um, a bar graph, so that you can actually see how those add up relative to one another. Um, stormwater retention credits uh, uh, tend to be quite uh, substantial. For some of these smaller ones, where they're small costs and looking like small benefits, we can uh, select any one of them and uh, just focus in on it. So let's say we're interested in looking at the cool roofs. We can see that they're, they have a fairly substantial benefit in the reduced ozone, um, reduced PM 2.5s. Notice as I'm hovering, there's an explanation of exactly why that counts as a benefit available. Um, if I, I can look at several of them at the same time. So there's a, a version of uh, cool roofs that also involves uh, ancillary rainwater harvesting. I can include that and uh, just see what the see what the breakdown is here. At this point, so what? Um, we can go back up, redo the uh, redo the calculations to kind of tweak it and see um, uh, try to meet various different goals. Uh, so that's starting over, or we can save the result, uh, which will bring us uh, to, again, I mentioned that bit about uh, showing our work. 
uh, whatever this whatever the tool sees is going to come to you as an Excel workbook. Uh, surface areas. This was roughly the um, the surface inventory that I showed that it was possible for us to customize. You can see what the tool is actually seeing for that particular neighborhood. Here's the breakdown of roofs. Uh, I mentioned interventions. These are the things that are actually being done to the city over that time period in uh, absolute numbers of square feet. Uh, if I have time, there's a slide that I want to show just talking about impacts, which are probably the deepest, most local part of the system. Uh, that's the listing of exactly how much accrues per square foot per year. Um, and that would be, uh, um, that's usually down in the pennies. Um, but, and so, and then when we come through, you can see here's what the cost, uh, here's what the, the benefits and cost actually came out as. And this is probably gonna go on for about 5,000 lines of uh, output for you to make graphs that we haven't thought about uh, or generally uh, you know, confirm that what we've uh, shown you is believable. Um, I see that I have just nailed 10 minutes. Uh, would it be possible for me to just have a couple more minutes or how are we doing for schedule here? I do have one slide. Sure, why don't we go ahead? All right, so I will make it quick. Okay, uh, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about how it's doing the calculations. So I, um, alluded to this uh, when we were talking about the Excel, um, the Excel output. I'm going to explain this just with a quick animation to build it over, but this is where the this is where we'll end. So, we start with the inventory. This is how many square feet of a specific surface. So, in this case, we're going to say we know that we have 15 square meters or sorry, 15 million square feet of roof. All the arithmetic, all the all the numbers here are chosen, hopefully to make the arithmetic fairly uh, straightforward to follow. Uh, we want to change over 20% of them to cool roofs, high albedo. We're going to do this over three years. Logically, this would imply if we're doing it, um, uh, we're going to be doing it on average a million square feet a year to get us to a total of three uh, three million, uh, which is 20% of 15. I talked about impacts, so. Much of the original PDF um, that's available on the Smart Surfaces Coalition site is actually um, talking about how these impacts get derived. They can uh, they can be a little hairy. There's probably about 400 of them uh, per uh, per area um, that we uh, that we have to come up with. So the examples that I'm going to use right now are say PM 2.5 reduction uh, and heat related mortality reduction. So for PM 2.5, I'm going to use, say, 10 cents per square foot per year. Uh, Heat-related mortality, 5 cents. Um, we expand these out. So the method is fairly, I'm hoping, fairly simple to follow. We have the year that we intervened and then the year that we accrued the um, benefit. So in the case of multiplying a million square feet by 10 cents, $100,000, 5 cents, $50,000. So in the year 2020, um, we book that as uh, the two benefits. It works very similarly for costs. It's just a negative number. Let's now go to 2021. So we're going to intervene again. We're going to add another million square feet. So now we're at 2 million. So we take the value of that. We take the discounted value of the ongoing benefit because now there's 2 million there's still the million from last year that we can count and so on. So when we intervene again, 3 million square feet, 100,000, and then backfill uh, from the uh, last two years. And that is, is what the 5,000 lines of um, cost benefit comes out as. And that's what the tool is doing for you in six quick clicks, hopefully. And I think I, okay, how did I do? All right, sorry, 15 minutes. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, um, we're going to turn real quickly to Kimberly Knox um, to tell us about the Green Network Plan. We'll hold the questions to the end. So, Kimberly, uh, if you can keep your presentation to about 10 minutes, then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. Thanks. And note that you're muted, Kimberly.
Sorry about that. Uh, let me pull up my presentation. Um, can you see it? Yes. Okay. So uh, um, my name is Kim Knox. I am the uh, Baltimore Green Network Green Coordinator for the City of um, Baltimore's Planning Department. Um, and the Baltimore Green Network is a, was approved by the Planning Commission in 2018. Um, it looks at, the, it's an overall vision uh, my, of connecting a 37 mile loop around the city, um, a multi-use trail. My portion is looking at the vacant lots within the city and working with the communities to um, create their vision of what they want to do with those lots. Um, Baltimore has 19,300 vacant lots. Um, for anybody who has been listening to Data Week, you know about Dr. Lawrence Brown's, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Dr. Lawrence Brown's work um, and his um, tagging the white L and the black butterfly. Um, the black butterfly, and you can see this clearly on the vacant lots um, the map, which shows. So Kimberly, can I just interrupt for one minute? I don't think we do have your presentation. We have the Office of Sustainability uh, on, on our screen, so we don't see a map. Okay, well, let me, let's see. You see that now? Okay. No. Uh, I need to stop sharing and reshare. Okay, I did. Um, let's see if this works. You see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let's go to the map of 19,300 vacant lots. Um, uh, the uh, the the 19,000 vacant lots. Um, I'm trying to talk at the same time. Um, but but you can see in terms of the, a lot in East Baltimore, a lot in West Baltimore, some in Park Heights, um, not as many along the black, the White L. Uh, the city has 14,000, 14, uh, sorry, 17,000 vacant houses. Um, and the reason why we have vacant houses and vacant lots is that we have a decrease in the amount of people um, that are living in Baltimore. Uh, 8,000, there was 8,000 vacant lots, uh, sorry, there was 800,000 8, people in 1940, um, and now there, there is approximately a little under um, six, 600, um, 600,000. So um, the key, the, the, all, all as we saw, um, specific neighborhoods um, are more likely to have vacant lots, and they tend to be the underestimated area. For example, Broadway East is a neighborhood community, um, so a neighborhood community that has the most amount of vacant lots of 935,000, 935, sorry. Um, and one of the things about vacant lots that we haven't talked about is that 60% of the vacant lots are privately owned and 70% of the vacant homes are privately owned. And with the vacant lots uh, that are privately owned, 78% have an owner with a Baltimore address. So that tells you kind of things of what happened in terms of those vacant lots in terms of the vacant homes. Um, we've been talking about smart surfaces and the vacant lots are all not necessarily all fields of grass, allowing stormwater to run off to soak in. Uh, vacant lots can and do experience dumping, and during the high growing season, high grass and weeds occur. Um, as many of you probably know, but uh, maybe not some, not all, um, if it's a privately owned lot, in order for you if, you, if a resident sees dumping or sees high grass, you have to call in a 311 call, City sends an inspector, if, and then the, the, the inspector does a citation, and then a city contractor will come and pick up the trash and mow the high grass and weeds. If it's a private, if it's a city-owned lot, the city's DPW um, solid waste crews will um, has a schedule of where they try to clean and mow the private, publicly uh, lot, publicly owned lots on a regular and monthly schedule. 
Um, but it, in terms of what the communities have been doing, again, Baltimore Green Network works with the residents on their own vision, the residents' own vision of what is going on um, in terms of what they want to see with those vacant lots. And they can create as passive space, active green space, community gardens, nature place spaces, cultivating of multi, multicultural, uh, more, more, actually cultivation of of wall one color in order to create splashes of color as well as trees um, lots of planting of trees um, in fact, uh, the Baltimore City Com Department of, Com of Housing and Community Development has a framework in terms of community investment where they're focusing on um, Park Heights east, um, so east side of the, of the um, of Baltimore East Baltimore West Baltimore and the Southwest partnership um, um, uh, start with partnership neighborhoods uh, that includes Broadway East, Johnson Square, East Baltimore, Midway, Hewitt Heights, Penn North, Upton, um, Franklin Square, Mount Clare. Um, and as we talked about in terms of a community vision, if you're living that, the Philadelphia and Pittsburgh have done several studies. And Philadelphia says if you clean and mow lots, you'll see an increase of home sale prices of $41,000 um, and gun violence reduction above 29%. Um, uh, obviously those study in John Hopkins is working on similar studies to look at in terms of Baltimore, but we all know what happens if you don't maintain those lots. And so the communities are coming together to look at what lots, where, where are the focus points, where's the dumping occurring and recreating those lots. For example, this is in Harlem Park, right across from Harlem Park um, School. They've created this beautiful um, passive uh, recreation center um, in Harlem, uh, on Harlem Park, um, next to four houses that Urban Roots owns. This is uh, a, a resident saw dumping on this lot, kept cleaning it up, kept cleaning it up, and said, you know, if I activate this lot, put in a horseshoe pit, I'll have lots more people coming and people won't be dumping on this lot. And it, it, after a while, it, that's how it worked. And people got so excited that they built a, a community garden. Then they got money for a mural. Then they got money for a playground. So if this, you start working with a specifically focused lots, um, it, it's been uh, from here, this is at 1800 West uh, Saratoga and Franklin Square. We're now looking at 1900 block of Saratoga. And then one of the things we haven't talked about is that there, uh, many of the vacant lots and many of the vacant homes have tax liens. Uh, this property is, on 1600 block of Riggs has a tax lien of, of approximately $800,000. So it's gonna be vacant for a while. And so the community recreated it as a community garden. First they did a little bit of gardening and, and expanded, expanded the garden. Um, and so that would create produce. This is in Spantown, Winchester. And not too far from this, from that location is, um, this is Harriet Tubman Community Garden, and it's right across from Gilmore Homes. It's, the lot is owned by Housing and um, How, uh, Housing Authority of Baltimore. And what they've done is they, the residents came, went to Housing uh, Housing Authority right after the death of Freddie Gray, uh, got permission to create this beautiful community garden, and you'll notice that the boxes. Some of them are painted green and some of them are painted red. And the green is any resident can harvest the vegetables from these planters. And the red is these, these plants are gonna be for sale to restaurants, to whoever wants to buy, and we're gonna use the money to keep the garden going. Um, and then in terms of the Baltimore Network also has pilot pro two pilot projects that I'll address. One is Cab Calloway Square on 81 lots in Blue Heights. Um, and the community is, is a community vision, community driven vision. Uh, and it's a, it, the, the lots were right next to houses that were being built by Druid Heights community. Um, some of them are selling it right in the, right, right now. You can buy a house um, near this park if you're a first time home buyer. And they've done that, the, they built homes on the west, they're being building houses on the north, working on building houses on the south, and on the east side, on the 22 on block east side of. 22 block of Druid Hill Avenue. They're rehabbing historic um, town row houses um, in order to create housing all around this park. 
but the commu legacy community residents also wanted the park in terms of creating a, um, a gathering space for the community. Um, this is the design that they created. Another, uh, uh, another pilot project that uh, the Baltimore Green Project, uh, Green Network is, is doing is the Rachel Wilson Memorial Park. Uh, Rachel Wilson was the first female firefighter to die in the line of duty in Maryland. Um, and she died on this spot in 2007. And the residents um, worked together to say, okay, we want to do something in her memory, um, working with the Wilson family. And so this is 21 vacant lots. Showing you that by, uh, when I started, if you look at the, the uh, this is from Code Map, if you look at the color of green, it's city owned. If you look at white, it's privately owned. But when I started two years ago, it was of half of that privately owned. But we've been buying the lots and working with the community to recreate the space into a park led by Geraldine Boyd, who is a longtime resident for 60 years within the community, who's been leading this effort. She was there when, when it happened, and she was the one who had the vision with the um, Rachel Wilson family. Um, and so since then, we've, uh, we've created the playground is out on bid. The bid should be coming on August the 4th. Mosaic has been installed. I was busily trying to put it, put it in when I realized, oh, wait, I can put it in, because we just installed that last week. Um, and then uh, as of uh, two hours ago, our, our funding was approved um, by the board, Baltimore Board of Estimates for fencing um, a pathway and a slide for, um, for, for this park. So next year, um, you're going to see lots of happy children at Rachel Wilson Memorial Park at 145 South Calverton. Be there or be square. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Baltimore um, Green Network Plan. And I, if you have any questions, I'm certainly, this is my contact information. Great, thank you so much, Kimberly. That's terrific and uh, such good work on part of the city of all the planning around the Green Network Plan. Um, I don't know, Cheryl, did you want to jump in and field questions now? Uh, well, uh, let's go through. So there are a couple questions in the Q&A that had been posted and there were a few at some point that had been added in to the webinar chat. So let's let's take a quick look. If you do have any other questions, uh, we have about eight minutes left in the session, so feel free to pop those in there. And then if the other panelists want to respond to you know what Kimberly said and how the tool might be useful, that would be great too. If I could just have one thing, um, the one of the things I should have mentioned was the Baltimore the Broadway East is a community that was part of your wonderful presentation yesterday. Um, and uh, Doris Minor, Dr. Doris Minor Terrell, the president, talked about how greening, they were using the green print, which they were creating for the, the lots, for a workforce, um, workforce opportunity. They have 46% unemployment in Broadway East. And using the opportunity of planting trees, cleaning and mowing and beautifying um, to provide workforce opportunities for the community was key. Did anyone, any of the panelists want to comment on Kimberly's presentation or ask any questions? Yeah, I thought it was really exciting. Um, I have a question for you, um, Kimberly, which is, you know, I was sort of stunned by your 19,000 vacant lots, and it seems like you're creating really fantastic examples of successful community adoption and taking something that's a blight and turning it into a benefit. Um, you know, as you do this, do you have a sense of what, what works? You know, are there some kind of basic lessons that are helpful to scale these up and then second is given the sort of overlay of smart surfaces and the sort of larger cost benefit mapping how does what you're doing fit with smart surfaces how can smart services be helpful to take what you're doing in hundreds of lots and making it sort of more compelling for the 17,000 lots the city has the 19,000, but um, at the, 
the key, I think, is working with what the community's vision is um, and what they feel uh, their phases are and um, also talking about what they're interested in. You know, for example, Broadway East is interested in, they're at 9% tree canopy. They want to increase that. Um, Druid Heights is looking at in terms of, they have homes that they're building. They want to bring in homeowners and businesses. How can you work in terms of smart surfaces? Um, with COVID-19, uh, you know, a lot of, of small businesses in um, Baltimore are, are struggling. And we heard that at the presentation last, about yesterday. And so how do you tie in local businesses um, to, for, for um, you know, in terms of the smart surfaces and the work that's going to be done? We deliberately, in terms of both Rachel Wilson and Druid Heights, um, partnered with a local contractor um, based in the community to clean and to mow. And I mean, again, uh, the Pittsburgh model, Pittsburgh model found that if for every dollar you invested in terms of maintenance, cleaning and maintenance, and a local based um, maintenance company, you get a dollar 85 in investment back. Versus if you do a regional, you get a, you know, 85 cents back. So being smarter in terms of the investment, especially during this time where a lot of people are looking for um, sustainable workforce opportunities. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, there were questions about how neighborhoods can start initiatives that would encourage these smart services. And I think you've helped answer that um, here in Baltimore. Uh, there's also a question, how do we get developers to use these tools um, in their community when they're building? Um, especially for low-income residents. Is that something you want to address, Greg? Boy, that's a tough Boy, question. Let <laughs> me turn off my speakerphone. Um, I, I think Kimberly put her finger on it, which is to work in communities that have community groups that are active, have a vision, are engaged, and make sure that at least the piece that we're bringing smart surfaces um, is presented and available and supported in a way that's supportive of that larger vision and is a useful tool so that, for example, if the community, as Kimberly said, wants to add a lot of trees, if the smart surface analysis around that um, low-income neighborhood demonstrates that there are substantial benefits in the neighborhood, but also demonstrates a lot of benefits citywide and that the combined citywide benefits of increased planning in that neighborhood is a compelling benefit story for the city. Um, then it's then and that is a case that we can quantify rigorously and and through Kimberly or, or go to the and the neighborhood has that they can no, now go back to the city for the first time with analysis that shows it's very much in the city's self-interest to support a big increase in trees in a neighborhood and they didn't have the tools to do that so i think in answer to your question i think it's really about um how can we make sure what we're doing is provided for and available to community groups and um, serve the larger vision of the community, which is why we're focused at the neighborhood level. I have, I have one thing to add as well, and it, it goes back to um, the question Greg asked earlier, which is, um, you know, what can journalism and, and storytelling do? And I think I work in the investigative journalism world, which is more about pointing out um, things that aren't working very well. But there's also, um, you know, media focused on solutions. Solutions journalism is a sort of up and coming uh, uh, field of journalism. And I think it's important to point out what's wrong, but it's also really important to show what's working. And, um, you know, you can inspire other neighborhoods um, uh, by, by explaining what's, what's, what's been going well. Great. Um, I apologize that we're not going to get to everybody's questions. I'm sorry about that, um, but we did maximize time for our presenters. Um, but there is one last question, um, which is kind of interesting, and the question is with autonomous vehicles um, and reduced need for parking lots and garages, um, what can smart services do, you know, in terms of reducing temperatures and uh, improving stormwater runoff? Yeah, I, 
as Dr. Benjamin said, I mean, the, you're sort of getting a bunch of things going on at smart surfaces. You've got reduced ambient temperature. Tree shade feels 10 to 12 degrees cooler. If you take a dark pavement and make it higher albedo, you're not having a huge amount of radiant heat pouring off of it and you have better air quality. That feels 15 to 20 degrees cooler. So are you gonna have people walking and biking through neighborhoods and being comfortable being outdoors? Well, if the neighborhood is attractive and greener, if it's lower temperature and air quality is better, yes. Um, the great Jane Jacobs uses the term, you know, eyes on the street and people are only out on the street if it's comfortable and they're comfortable if the temperature is comfortable and the shading and air quality is good and it's a green. So the neighborhoods that are vibrant are ones where people want to be outdoors and because they're outdoors, there's no crime. And because there's no crime and it's nice outside, people run around and play, which then means they get exercise, which means there's stronger community. I mean, there's either, a, there tends to be either a self-reinforcing positive cycle or communities become vibrant. I think like the last one, Kimberly showed where you've got this wonderful central park that's been, you know, and then a lot of people wanting to move in around it and revitalizing houses. That looks like an example of a wonderful neighborhood. And part of that is making that space attractive and appealing. So the idea well, of autonomous vehicles or more generally moving away from car dependence requires a viable alternative. And that is not just availability of bikes. It means I actually want a bike because it's safe and because it's, you know, air quality is, is relatively good or I want to walk or you know, and so it's, um, we, we have sort of, we think about, you know, buildings as machines, right, is what Mies van der Rohe said, but we're not machines. We are social creatures. We're going to be happy when we're in a society where we bump into people and we chat with them and it's fun to sit on the stoop or sit on a park bench and we seem to yeah. have forgotten that. And I think we this can whole only, movement we can um, only of which hope. Smart, smart serves as a small part is really about saying, hey, let's go ahead and, and, and reclaim those benefits. Let's assert that the value of heat reduction is large, quantified, and make our claims in a way that's rigorous so we can get cities making smart investments in the right ways in the right locations in well, support As a planner, of I love ending with uh, Jane Jacobs and with uh, parks. <laughs> and uh, our time is up. Um, we're actually a little past time, sorry about that. And I really wanna thank all of our speakers. Um, you know, Dr. Georges Benjamin, who uh, has left us now, Elizabeth Gothorpe, Kim Knox, Greg Katz, Ryan McGreg. Um, you've all been terrific and we're getting lots of nice comments back about you. So thanks for your time. Thanks for all you're doing and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye everyone.